School is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. I'm Lindsay Smith with RealAgriculture.com. I'm joined today by Tracy Bodie. She's a field crop entomologist with OMAFRA. Welcome here, Tracy. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Tracy, of course, we're getting down to the wire for um, a, a couple deadlines coming up for ordering seed treatments, uh, fungicide-only seed treatments. How do farmers go through the process of figuring out which fields uh, might benefit from uh, a neonic treatment or which can probably do without? That's a great question, and, and we've tried our best at providing as many resources as possible for them to know their risks and understand them and go through, uh, for example, evaluation checklists, specifically identifying what factors place them at risk of certain pests. Not every field is at risk, and, and certain factors really do play a, a strong role as to whether certain pests are going to be a problem. And so if they can identify themselves um, as to having those factors or not having those factors, they can then figure out which fields need the insecticide treatment and which ones do not. So now walk me through some of the some of the risk factors and when uh, now some of these things are, are say soil type and those those sorts of things but walk me through when you should also be scouting for the insects that you need protection from. Right. Okay. So um, things like grubs and wireworms, two that are probably identified as the, the most prevalent out there by growers, are really strongly tied to soil types. So sandy and silty soil types. Um, tend to be those that are greatest at risk, and especially if there's on also a, a grass crop rotation frequently in, in that scheme, whether it's um, cereals, forages, um, and, and in some cases, you know, coming out of pasture. Um, that really get, puts them more at risk of, of things like grubs and, and wireworms. But fortunately, when it comes to those two insects, they are actually up at the soil surface both in the spring and the fall. So those are two insects that they could technically go out now um, prior to the ground freezing and see if they're present um, simply by um, setting up wireworm baits or digging around and especially looking in problem areas like sa sandy knolls uh, for the grubs that could be present there. All right. And now, um, what other what other insects are farmers concerned about with and, and are using neonics to combat? Well, in terms of um, um, soybeans in particular, they're concerned about bean leaf beetles and soybean aphids. And, and um, for the most part, we can identify at least in terms of geographical areas that are more at risk of early season uh, infestations. Because you have to remember, these seed treatments really are only in those plants for a few weeks. Um, once the plant comes out of the ground. And so if the insect isn't there in those first early V stages, uh, they're not getting protection um, or they don't need the protection. And so there are certain geographical areas that are more prone to, for example, overwintering populations of bean leaf beetle and those geographical areas like eastern Ontario that have prevalent buckthorn that are much more prone to having the early season soybean acid infestations as well. So again, growers can go through the evaluation checklist and determine which factors place them most at risk and whether or not they, they can go without uh, the neonic seed treatment and, and order some fungicide only. Now how then uh, will, or how does, I suppose, um, this the spring planting weather play a role in all this? I mean, obviously this is a decision that has to be made well ahead of knowing what the weather is going to be like. So if... So I guess one of my questions, if, if a farmer evaluates themselves at a relatively low risk and chooses to go fungicide only, what are the risks of that sort of backfiring? How much can, can the spring really impact insect levels? Well, in terms of soybeans in particular, they're fortunate in that they, they may still be able to make decisions about uh, fungicide only in the spring. But when it comes to corn, you're right, they need to make all the decisions in the fall. Um, but weather plays a role in impacting the pests that are present. So if the pest isn't present, um, the spring conditions really aren't going to increase their infest or their arrival. Um, for example, um, wireworms and grubs, uh, ironically, they're not even really controlled by the neonic. They're just 
protected, uh, they, they're stunned, and so the crop is protected by them. So in a cool, wet spring, uh, when the crop is slow to emerge, uh, you will see more injury from those pests that are actually present. So yes, in, one can say that spring cool, wet conditions increases pest injury, uh, but it doesn't necessarily fully increase a grower's risk to the pest. They, they already have to have some kind of history of the pest. The only exception to that rule is uh, something like black cutworm, which arrives in the spring. So if we have an early season where the moths are flying in from the U.S. Um, and they land when growers can't get into the fields and control all those weeds that are on the soil surface, then that puts them at risk. But if, if that's the case then, and black cutworm is a, a problem, they've got the transgenics, the Cry1F uh, BT corn that they can use for control and, and um, be, get very good control of, of that uh, issue. Okay, so lots of options. So now any tips for, uh, now obviously this is the, the regulatory framework around neonics is sort of in a state of flux and we'll see uh, going forward what might change around that. Uh, and, and we don't really have any hard and fast rules about that yet. But how could farmers next season, whether in the spring or through the growing season, perhaps start to fine tune which fields are at risk and which are not? Because we're, I mean, we're sort of at crunch time now. What could they do ahead of time next year? Mm-hmm. A lot of it is, you know, know these risks, understand them a bit better, and then uh, keep that in mind every time you're uh, traveling into those fields and figuring out, do they have that soil type? Uh, am I getting the weed control in time, or is it a problem in the spring? I, I certainly don't expect that every grower um, will be able to walk away from using new nicks, but most of them will have a certain percentage of fields that really are not at risk and could move towards the fungicide only. If they're all in question do strip trials, have some um, replicated strips throughout their field and, and look and see what happens through the, fe- through the season as well as the yield in the end. Um, really, a lot of it is looking early on when the crop is emerging, do you see any gaps in the stand, do you see any problem areas, and dig. It takes a shovel, but, uh, you know, something as prevalent as wireworms and grubs, for example, are going to be there. Um, they, they're hanging out at the roots of those plants. And so uh, re-educating yourself on what's present and what's not will really help you understand um, where it's needed and where you can move away and, and reduce the risk. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, Tracy. Lots of work to do uh, this fall and some great tips for the spring. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. 